Welcome to Pivot Point Church for today's message on March 17th, 2024. Today we continue our study in the R-rated life. This week we're going to study Refuse, Reshape, and Refine. Please make sure you download our free app. It's available on Google or Apple. It's also the best way to keep up with things that are Pivot Point. If you would please comment on our platform so we know you're here. If you would or could, please also fill our Connect card so we can know where you are and what app you're with. We'd also love to hear from you. Don't forget to listen to today's music as well. And that can be found on YouTube channel and also on Spotify now. The links can be found on our app or on the website. Please like and share our video posts. These videos and other things help us find us. Word of mouth is our best advertisement. There is, and you can help us by simply sharing our videos and posts. Hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any of our messages. So let's pray. I pray, Father, that this message would be your message today, not mine, and that these would be your words, again, not mine. So let's start with an introduction into the R-rated life today with some real focus on vocabulary. Let's get some discussion around these things for refuse, reshape, and refine. Today, we also get started on these topics. Let's look at the definition so we all have the same starting point. So for refuse, we have the idea that it's an expression or express unwillingness to accept something or to do something or to comply with someone or something. Reshape. That's an act of giving a new form, an orientation, or something like that to reorganize it. And then finally, it could also be transforming or modifying something to create something yet completely different, an arrangement. And then refine. That's to free something from impurities or unwanted materials in it. That one also has the idea of purifying a state removing coarse or vulgar items from it, debasing it, to improve it by puning or polishing or perfecting it. What does it mean to refuse something in our lives? What does that look like? What does it look like when a human being created by God has refused everything that has been presented to them? The first point probably is a point of doubt of God's truth and a major issue with the Bible. The person probably says something like this, my God would not do that. Or they would say something like, this part of scripture doesn't align with the world today. We should retract it or remove it from the Bible to help it be more acceptable to everyone else. The final point might look like the idea of refusing would be to just basically disagree with any historic fact that has been proven beyond measure. And finally, not believing in God and refuse to even think that Christ lived. And they show love for these kinds of things on earth. So they don't follow God. They don't love God. So let's review refuse. It's an express unwillingness to do or accept or comply with someone or something. So on its own, the definition is not a bad thing to have in our lives, but should not be that we are refusing the facts and the foundation of Christianity. Now, I'm not one to just accept everything as a pastor says. I believe that we are held accountable to test it with the word of God. And if it's proven to be true, honest, and righteous, then I am to accept it. That doesn't mean I have to agree with it, but accept it. There are things I don't fully understand with God. Let me give you an example of this. I can remember being newly married in the late 80s. I can also say it was the 80s. And I remember a really important pastor living in Colorado Springs claiming that Jesus was coming back on a specific date. That date was September 13, 1988. Let me explain a little further. I was a newlywed. 
a husband just trying to learn to live with his wife. And I was really concerned about this point of prophecy. But that day, that date came and went. Now, I don't recall what happened to the pastor, but I recall a line that my adoptive father would say, test it to see if it's true. If it comes back a truth, then accept it. For prophecy to be accepted, it must happen just as it has been given. I still believe that Jesus is coming back, but he did not come back in 1988. So, what should the word refuse mean to you and me? That is answered very quickly in Romans 12. In verses 1 and 2, I'll share with you. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. So, there is what it says should be to refuse the world. Not to refuse God, refuse the world. To test the things of this world and let God show you what we need to know. We express our unwillingness to live like the rest of the world. Let me remind you what God has done for us. This would be Ephesians 3, or 1, 3 through 14. Praise be to the Father, God, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption through the sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in him, the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he has lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mysteries of the accordance of his good pleasure and his purpose in Christ to be put into effect in the other times and fulfillment, to be the unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him, who works everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal that promised the Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Now, God has blessed us. We saw that in verse 3. He has chosen us in verse 4, adopted us in verse 5 accepted us in verse 6. He's redeemed us in verse 7, given us grace and wisdom in verse 8, made known his mysteries of his will in verse 9, granted us inheritance in verse 14. So we have a Savior who's been there. So by refusing what God has done for you, not accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are distancing yourself away from God. God will not force himself on anyone. His desire is none should perish, but come to have everlasting life through his Son, Jesus. The Holy Spirit encourages us. Christ died for us and intercedes for us. God lavishes us with his love and all good things in our lives. Then, how is reshape affecting a believer? 
So what does it mean for a believer in Jesus to be reshaped? This is a really cool R word, and it's really packed tightly. So let's unbreak it down and unpack it. To reshape is an action of giving a new form to something old, or maybe not complete, or transforming or modifying someone or something. Maybe a better definition would be for the use to create something different from its current form, an arrangement. Reshaping is an act of God, shaping us to be like Christ. 1 John 3, 1 through 3 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. That is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it didn't know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not been made known. But we know when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Using the Holy Spirit, he shapes us just like the potter shapes clay. This metaphor is extremely important. God, through the Holy Spirit, continues working on us until we are what he wants us to be, his children. That is exciting. If you're watching a potter, pay attention to what they're doing. They're extremely focused on what's going on, laying a base by hand. Then the potter's not playing with it. They're working it. They have a design purpose. Sometimes the potter must start over and removes the clay from the wheel. Or even better yet, sometimes the potter has to add clay so it will work. With that design purpose in mind, the potter continues to shape the clay until it's achieved its purpose and shape. Just like the potter, God continues to shape us using the current circumstances we're in. It might be to seek him or to learn how to go through issues holding on to him. But you can be sure of one thing that is true. God wants to draw you closer to him. He utilizes everything and anything in our lives as a point to reshaping us, aligning us, and creating a new life form. A new form that loves differently, that cares differently. A life reshaped. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness, recalling a solid pastor that I used to listen to on the radio, Dr. J. Vernon McGee. I recall what Paul writes in Ephesians. You were dead in your trespasses and sin, but not that in the end, we are made alive in Christ even though we were dead. It is by grace we are saved, remembering that we are God's handiwork, created in Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So my question is, which way do you see God reshaping you? He is making me what he wants, James 1.3. He is motivating me to follow him, Hebrews 5, 8. He is showing me how to work with others, 2 Corinthians 1, 6. He keeps me from doing my own thing that could hurt me, 2 Corinthians 12, 7. He helps me identify with Jesus, Philippians 3, 10. Helps me to grow in my faith, 1 Peter 5, 10. And then he shows me how to be examples to others so they might come to know Jesus, 2 Timothy 2.10. Now, there are also quick verses that are always there, but a couple of them are like 1 Peter 5.10. And the God of all grace, who called you from his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. James 1, 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, wherever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let that perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without fault, and you will be given what you need. 
So, the gracious act of giving me a new form, we are transformed, reshaped by the Spirit, and we are also given outrageous gifts of God through Jesus, His Son. That doesn't mean everything's perfect, but life without Jesus is like a John Wayne quote, Life's hard, pilgrim. It's even harder without Christ. So, now that we think about this, what does refinement have to do with this, or refined by God mean? It's our last R word. What does this mean to be refined by Christ or by God? Refined means to free something from its impurities or unwanted materials, but may refine also to elevate free from moral imperfections. These actions require the item to be improved or be made perfect, pruning and polishing. I might want to refine a paper that I have written or an email that needs to be edited before being sent out. Some of us might have heard another process for refining materials. That refining materials also has steps. Like step one for gold, melt it with fire, test it for purity. Step two, remove impurities with gas. Step three, remove the slag with fire. Step four, use electrolysis to remove remaining impurities. Step five, check purities and pour it into bars. It seems that each point in this process, fire is used to remove impurities from the ore. Just like us, for our purest point and our impurities, our sins have to be removed. Just like the Christians, we walk justified by accepting Jesus. We are slowly being sanctified by God through our, our process or our walk. And finally, then we are glorified in the end. Just as the process we are traveling through this life and are being made more like Jesus, refining us, refined to elevate or to remove imperfections, freeing us to move and be more like Jesus. So how does God do this? One, he purifies us. Created in the image of God, our sinful nature must be set aside and chained. That's Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are those pure in heart, for they will see God. This allows us to be seen and see Him. We are changed, as we noted above, and we're justified for just asking for forgiveness and then sanctified as we continue forward. Second, we are made righteous, offering. God requires us to be a living sacrifice. Remember we talked about it in Romans. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the mercy of God's law, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. There. When we talk about this, we're reflecting the character of Jesus as well. That's the next step. It's a continuation of step one, sanctification, removing the impurities. And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver purified in a crucible, like gold has been refined seven times. Four, we're to live the life that God wants us to live. The thief comes to kill and destroy but I have come that you might have life and to live it full. That's John 10, 10. God desires us to live like this, where we are so different from the world that we will not be missed. We won't miss even one step with him. So let me give you my finest example I can remember. This one hurts a bit, but it's the truth. It was when I was with my middle child and we were going to summer camp. And we had a few hundred miles north of us. As a scoutmaster of the troop, we had to make sure that everyone got there at the same location at the same time. This was a time when my son and I were getting along. We had a few impurities in our relationship. So the drive allowed us for a long, long, long road of quiet. I had been hurting him by not trusting him. 
him and hurting me by not allowing me to do things. We angered each other. Crossing into that next day, we finally started talking. It was really slow, testing each other. But by the end of that week, we were finally getting well along. The steps we took in our refinement of our relationship is just like that of sanctification here. Coming back, we had a really great talk with the windows down and everything else and a lot of impurities going out the window. So, that's what it's like. The last part of this, let's recap what God has done for us. As he's offered Jesus to us. So what do we learn today? An R-rated life is more than a John Wayne quote. When the road looks tough, pilgrim ahead, remember that a man upstairs and hope. Hang on to both and tough it out. There's some logic here, but we have to look at our R's this week. Refuse, reshape, and refine. I'm not wanting to tough through something or go through something and tough it out. But it might really reflect what's going on here. So let's recap. We want to refuse to be like the world. This means that we express our unwillingness to live like the rest of the world and that we remember what God has done for us. And the great examples from Ephesians 1. We are blessed, chosen, accepted, redeemed. Grace is given to us. We have an inheritance. For the next segment on reshape, we saw that God is like a potter, working us like clay. We have lived up to his purpose for us. For just like the pottery, we are created by him to live in him. We die with him. That is also means we endure with him. And then we reign with him. He will not disown us. He will not be faithless towards us. He is the opposite of what we deserve. So this means that God who has called us will restore us so that we will stand firm and steadfast. The last word refine is probably the most difficult. But to say it like this, God who loves us enough to make us what he wants, he motivates us, he comforts us, and helps us to grow. Then read the refinement process, continuing removal, that process of removing sin in our lives. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation still stands firm. That foundation, that based on everything, is built on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's remember John 3.16 and 17. You can say 3.16 pretty well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. He desires to live lives so differently that people will see him not me not you but him are you able to refuse to live like Jesus or are you refusing to live like the world and to live for Jesus this is the time this is the space the calling is here don't ignore the Holy Spirit if you're being tapped on the shoulder and your heart's being wrenched, it's time that you ask Jesus into your life. Let's think of it this way. Let's say the prayer. Dear Lord, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Come into my life and cleanse me from my unbelief. I believe in you and your salvation through Jesus Christ and his blood. I turn from sin and trust in Jesus alone as my Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you just prayed this prayer, welcome to the family. Email Pastor Ruth and let us know you're in. We would love to help you connect with your faith. Thank you for watching today. Please join us on Tuesdays. We have a Zoom Bible study at 7 o'clock. We're currently studying the book of Hebrews. It's quite a bit of stuff going on there. The link can be found on our website or on our app under events. If you can't make it in person, email us at pastor.ruthking at yahoo.com and we will help you do the study on your own. Please complete the connect card 
on our website or on the app and comment on wherever platform you are watching so we know you're here. If you found this ministry to be a benefit to you, please consider supporting us. The easiest way is to give by using the gift tab on our website or on our app. All donations are still tax deductible. We're looking for some volunteer and for some help. With our online presence, there's so much to do here and often more than we can do alone. We want to be able to do more and watch have more people watch. So if you're tech savvy and enjoy social media, like to edit videos or would like to be interested in helping create a, a ministry, maybe a children's ministry or a music ministry, please reach out to us. We could really use the help. This week, I hope you can find a way to be a blessing. That's Pastor Ruth as normal. What I'd like to say is live the R-rated life. Take it out for a spin. It's time to trust God. We hope to see you next week. God bless.